Uh, my presentation, I'm going to keep it real, real short. I know that people want to get to questions, and we're running a little behind, so I'm going to be as quick as possible. And I'm basically going to talk about how and why we need toilet seats. Okay. So, the ecological problems we face today are much, much bigger than just climate change. I mean, we've got the acidifications of the oceans, we've got the Amazon jungle, the lungs of the planet being chopped down faster than ever before. If we are to be serious about ecological sustainability, we need to look at what that problem all is. The combined ecological problem is never-ending industrial growth. It don't stop none. So we need to look at its impetus that driving force behind the industrial growth, and that is efficiency. The more efficient we become, the more we can produce and consume with less labor. That's the important part, is the labor link. If we do not consume more, we land up with rising unemployment and a potential recession. I want to give you some historical examples, because this has been happening now for thousands of years. 1758, James Hargreaves, who, know, who knows James Hargreaves over here? Uh, you've heard this before. <laughs> uh, so James Hargreaves, he comes up with the technological invention, the wonder of its day. It's the spinning jenny. You can now spin yarn twice as fast with half the amount of labor. Incredible. But what does it do to the economy? Well, people lose their jobs. A lot of yarn spinners are now unemployed. And this is the beginning of a very interesting revolution. It's the movement of the Luddites. Um, they would smash machines, and it was so serious that the British government even imposed a law that you damage a machine, it was death sentence. What got England out of its little textile recession was people started to consume more. You see, that's what efficiency does. You can produce and consume with more with less labor, but unless you consume more, you end up in a recession. Wild, extravagant consumerist ideas, such as changing your underwear, completely ludicrous at the time, weekly. I mean, who ever thought of that? It all started to catch on. Wild, extravagant consumerist ideas. But eventually, consumption caught up to production, which was boosted by efficiency. We're going to jump a little forward. Henry Ford comes up with the, the technology wonder of his day. It wasn't the assembly line. It was the electrification of the assembly line. He could now produce more cars faster than ever before with less labor. Production doubled, quadrupled, at the same time as employment shrinking. He was so happy with his new invention that he went and told everybody in the States, all the industries, make your radios like this, make your guns like this, make your typewriters, what, make everything like this. Assembly line, electrified. The output of the United States doubled and tripled. But consumption didn't. You see, you add an efficiency into the system. It means you can produce and consume with less labor. But unless consumption catches up, it's the consumption part. If it don't catch up none, you've got rising unemployment and a potential recession. And that was the fundamental of the Great Depression. You see, our great-great-grandparents, they were the frugal bunch. A chest of drawers was passed on from mother to daughter to daughter to mother. Well, maybe not exactly like that, but it was passed on. <laughs> uh, a set of spoons. Here it is. Take it on at your wedding day. And that would pass on. People didn't waste anything. They were frugal. Consumption did not equal production. Eventually, production caught up in the form of the Second World War, but after that, it was through suburbia. People, um, one of the things that Roosevelt did, to, he needed more to increase employment, so he said, well, oh, there's a lot of disgruntled people up there, and they, they're revolting. They really are. And I need to give them jobs. So he got them building roads. And where the roads went, where developers decide, hey, we can build houses over here. These were different from previous uh, smaller apartments that people lived in cities. You can now move to the country and you now had a basement where you can put stuff. 
and you needed two cars. Previously in the city with the electrical tram system, you didn't even need a car. Two cars, one for mama and one for papa. You see, that's what efficiency does. You can produce and consume with less labor, but if you don't consume more, you end up in a recession. It doesn't really matter where that efficiency comes from. Let me give you another example. There was a time that the primary fuel source really was wood. You wanted uh, your fuel source, you had to go out and chop a tree. But, well, eventually, coal surpassed wood. Coal, based on our definition of green, was a green miracle. I mean, it was twice as efficient. And it was also more environmentally friendly because you didn't have to chop down the forest. See, twice as efficient, but what was the consequence? Well, it spurred a whole lot of new growth. You had trains, you had the Industrial Revolution. Petroleum comes and replaces coal. Petrol, twice as efficient as coal. It also produces less sulfur and mercury, less polluting. Based on our definition of green, petrol was the green miracle. But it wasn't really. You see, the efficiency just rebounds elsewhere. More cars, aeroplanes, growth. It doesn't matter where an efficiency enters the system. A more efficient accounting system can be just as deadly to the environment as a mine. I know that sounds crazy, but think about it for a moment. If that accounting system results in people losing jobs, it means we again have to grow the economy with growth. Now, the definition of, I know the word efficiency, people say, you can't use the word efficiency, use the word productivity. The reason why I'm talking about, and I stick to the word efficiency, is because a lot of efficiencies, even when people are talking about resource efficiencies, when you look at it through a business model, it really is all about labor. Take example, uh, the Boeing um, Dreamliner, 20% um, more efficient. Does that mean the plane is 20% more efficient? Yes, but it also means that it uses 20% less fuel, which means that you have to produce 20% less fuel. There are jobs lost. Even though people are talking about the efficiency of the airplane, the consequence to the economy and the environment is the efficiency on labor. What I'm talking about is labor efficiency and why I'm stubborn on the topic is because most efficiencies, when you analyze their effect, as it, er, as it moves through the economy, is labor. Labor is what links all the sectors. We have been becoming increasingly efficient over the last 2,000 years, but our ecological footprint has been increasing. Let me give you another example of efficiency um, that's that you don't see as a labor efficiency. Suppose you have a group of uh, developers. Ah, business is bad. We need to build more condos. The city plan is now entered and say, oh, but we can't. We're living in one of the most congested cities of the world. There's so many cars. I mean, if we build more condos, how are people going to get around? The whole city will be gridlocked. What are we going to do? Oh, let's promote bicycles and more efficient transportation. Sounds a little crazy, but that efficiency that comes from the more efficient transportation system rebounds into condos. It can rebound anywhere. You see, ecological efficiency, uh, you see, let me get to the toilet seats. You see, if we add an efficiency somewhere, it means that there are jobs that need to be created somewhere else, and people need new, wild, extravagant consumer products. And in this case, it's toilet seats, because people need jobs. How we deal with sustainability and the Javins paradox, oddly enough, is about thinking everything in reverse. That's why it's such an interesting topic. A lot of the ideas that we think will reduce our ecological footprint are the things that will increase it. That's why our ecological footprint has been increasing. A lot of the ideas that we think will do, uh, well, sorry, a lot of the ideas that we think will uh, increase our ecological footprint will have the exact opposite effect. Take this for a crazy idea. Instead of bicycles, what about 18-wheeler trucks? It sounds crazy, but if you wanted the efficiency that goes through the system with a more efficient transport station, the most inefficient way for a city to get around 
would be 18-wheeler trucks. The city, the economy, would shrink. It would collapse. People would not be able to afford their vacation trips. They wouldn't be able to afford electric toilet seats. You see, the efficiency that you add will rebound somewhere else. And inefficiency, even though it goes against every grain in your body, <laughs> and is completely impossible. I mean, I don't want to drive an 18-wheeler truck, but I'm just giving you it as an example. Everything is backwards. That's why it's so interesting. Um, I think that's all I had to say. Thanks.